He's showing signs of consciousness, but then fades out. Patience is key now. The doctor then detailed my injuries, a severe concussion, a broken arm, and various bruises. It was overwhelming to hear. Their conversation continued, with the first voice asking about the specifics of my injuries. I closed my eyes, trying to regulate my breathing despite the pain. The doctor confirmed the extent of my injuries, adding details about the incident. Then, the topic shifted to the ongoing investigation. Two officers discussed the event, mentioning witnesses and a video that captured part of the incident. The details they discussed painted a picture of a chaotic, violent scene. Lying there, I processed what I had heard. Despite the pain, my mind was alert, and I began to strategize about how I could use this information to my advantage. The person responsible for my fall needed to face the consequences. Three weeks earlier, this whole situation had started when my wife, Judy, received a text from her boss, Mark Danvers, while she was in the shower. I had seen the message on her phone. It wasn't the first time Mark had sent inappropriate messages to Judy, and I was growing increasingly concerned about his behavior. As I thought about the text, I realized there was something wrong. Judy and I had a solid relationship, or so I thought, but this incident made me question that. We had met in college and connected instantly despite our different social circles. I had always been the nerdy type, but we clicked once we got to know each other. I never thought of myself as the stereotypical attractive guy, but I had my own qualities. I even joked about it once with my sister and her friends, confidently asserting my self-worth despite their teasing. Judy had even complimented me in private, affirming my self-esteem. But this wasn't about physical attributes. It was about trust and loyalty. Judy and I had been talking about starting a family, but now, with this revelation, those plans seemed foolish. I felt betrayed, realizing that she might be unfaithful. The idea of being intimate with her now felt impossible. I retreated to our spare room, where we had a computer, and began searching for information on how to monitor her phone activities. Although I hated the idea of spying, I needed to know the truth. It was like monitoring a child for their safety, except this time, it was to protect my own heart. As I set up the spy app on her phone, I realized Mark was more than just a boss to Judy, their interactions were far from professional. I discovered they had been meeting frequently, their casual flirting masking something much deeper. The realization hit me hard, my trust in Judy was shattered. I had to plan my next steps carefully, knowing that my life was about to change drastically. The path ahead was unclear, but one thing was certain, I needed to confront the truth, no matter how painful it might be. I had a hunch that the multiple calls between Judy and her boss, Mark, were more about personal matters than business. The one text I had caught was already too much, and their phone conversations seemed to be even more intimate. I made sure to save a particularly revealing conversation they had. It wasn't necessary for the divorce I was planning, but I wanted concrete proof of Judy's infidelity. Mark suggested meeting up when I was out of town, using derogatory language towards me. Judy rebuked him for his disrespect and corrected his assumptions about me. The conversation was a mix of their physical relationship and occasional disagreements about how Mark treated her. It became clear that Judy was looking for something different in her relationship with Mark, something rougher than what we shared. But she also set her boundaries with him, especially when he got too rough or disrespectful. Their conversation took a turn when Mark expressed interest in a more adventurous physical relationship, which Judy promptly shut down, emphasizing her limits and her love for me. She warned him about using disrespectful language and set conditions for their continued encounters. The topic of starting a family came up, and Judy mentioned our plans to have a baby, insisting on precautions to ensure that wouldn't happen with Mark. Mark joked about the situation, but Judy was serious, stating the legal implications if such a scenario occurred. That conversation solidified my decision. Judy's affair might not be legally admissible due to recording laws, but it didn't matter. I needed to know the truth for myself. I was prepared for Judy to downplay her affair and paint me as the unreasonable one, but I was resolved to proceed with the separation. As I planned my next steps, I focused on getting my finances in order. I paid off all our debts, starting with my significant college loans. We were cautious with our finances, with no car payments and a small savings for a future home. I also began discreetly saving some cash on the side, anticipating the financial implications of a divorce. I researched legal advice, realizing that I might be responsible for alimony due to the difference in our incomes. I considered paying my lawyer's fees up front to reduce our available cash. I had been strategically reducing our cash reserves as much as I could. I considered having my paycheck diverted to a separate account, but I knew I would still be obligated to give Judy her fair share. My goal was to prevent her from accessing more than she was entitled to. I had already retained an attorney and was preparing to file for divorce. I knew things would get messy once Judy was served with the papers. Returning to the day in question, the day that catalyzed my decision, I was supposed to be out of town for work, but I had arranged for a coworker to cover my account so I could deal with my personal issues. I spent my spare time mulling over different scenarios for confronting Judy and Mark. Initially, I imagined catching them in the act and confronting them dramatically. 
However, I quickly realized that any violent reaction on my part would only lead to legal trouble for me. Given the physical difference between Mark and me, he was significantly larger and more athletic. A direct physical confrontation was out of the question. I had to be smarter, more strategic. But all my careful planning was forgotten in an instant when I walked into my apartment and found Judy and Mark together. The shock of the scene before me was overwhelming. Mark reacted aggressively when I interrupted them, and in the ensuing scuffle, Judy grabbed my arm, preventing me from reaching my firearm. The struggle escalated quickly, and before I knew it, Mark had pushed me out the door, sending me tumbling down the stairs. Back in the present, lying in the hospital bed, I listened to the police officers discussing the incident. I realized I needed to come up with a new plan, one that would work better than my previous ideas. When the doctor checked on me after I signaled that I was awake, he instructed me to minimize movement, advice that seemed quite obvious given my condition. The police officers then entered to take my statement. I recounted most of what had actually happened, admitting that I knew about the affair and was planning to divorce Judy. I described the physical altercation with Mark. However, I added a crucial detail to my story. I claimed that Mark had threatened to kill me during the fight and that Judy had urged him to act quickly. Was I troubled by the fact that I was lying, especially about such serious accusations? No, I wasn't. I felt justified in my actions given their betrayal. My main concern was whether there was any evidence that could contradict my story, like a video recording of their encounter. The thought of such evidence existing worried me, but for now, I was focused on ensuring that my version of events was the one that was believed. I was meticulous in managing our finances, ensuring that our cash reserves were carefully controlled. While I couldn't stop Judy from receiving her rightful share, I was determined to prevent her from accessing more than that. I had already engaged a lawyer and was in the process of preparing for divorce, knowing that it would create a significant upheaval. On the day everything escalated, I had arranged to be home instead of traveling for work. I had been mulling over various scenarios for confronting Judy and Mark. While my initial thoughts were driven by a desire for dramatic confrontation, I soon realized the legal implications of any aggressive action. The day I walked in on Judy and Mark, I was hit with a whirlwind of emotions. Mark's reaction was aggressive, and in the heat of the moment, I found myself in a physical struggle. Forensic evidence later supported my account of the events, contradicting Mark's claim that I had attacked him and that he was merely defending himself. Judy corroborated parts of Mark's story but admitted he had pushed me hard. The investigation revealed evidence that supported my version of events, showing that I was in close proximity to Mark during the altercation. Mark was initially charged with assault, not attempted murder, and was able to post bail. I was kept in the dark about these developments until my health stabilized, as my brothers and the doctors wanted to ensure my recovery was not hindered by stress. After giving my statement to the police, I experienced a medical episode and lost consciousness. When I awoke, Judy was in the room, and I reacted strongly, insisting that she was involved in the attempt on my life. Despite my outburst, part of me wanted to confront her about the affair and her choices. I couldn't fathom why she hadn't just talked to me if she desired a different kind of intimacy in our relationship. Instead, she had chosen to betray our marriage. I spent a week in the hospital under close observation. My brothers were regular visitors, and I eventually confided in them that I might have exaggerated Judy's role in the incident, but for now, I wanted her to feel the weight of her actions. One of my visitors was Julie, Mark's wife. She was looking for information about the incident, as Mark had given her a sanitized version of what happened. I informed her about the affair between Judy and Mark, including the evidence I had collected. Julie was understandably shocked and expressed her intention to pursue a divorce, armed with the proof of infidelity. I reassured Julie that I would assist her with obtaining the evidence she needed. I explained that both Judy and Mark seemed unaware of the extent of the evidence against them and were sticking to their fabricated story. I speculated that Mark was likely doing everything he could to mitigate the situation, including possibly hiding assets. Julie thanked me for my help and left to see her lawyer, determined to protect her interests in the impending storm. Despite the turmoil, I couldn't help but feel a sense of sympathy for Julie. Neither she nor I deserved the chaos that Mark and Judy had brought into our lives. The day after I was discharged from the hospital, I found myself at my family's fishing camp, planning to take as much medical leave as possible and then use my vacation time. My boss was sympathetic to my situation and even proposed a way for me to work remotely for a couple of hours a day so I could still earn my regular pay. As I sat there, I reflected on the drastic steps I had taken. I had cancelled our joint credit card and left Judy with her half of the balance. It wasn't much since I had already paid off our debts. I was careful not to act too soon, but now was the time to finalize things. I wouldn't provide any financial support for Judy until the court ordered me to. Julie, Mark's wife, had moved quickly after I informed her of the affair. She had secured her share of their assets and locked down their investment accounts. Meanwhile, I wanted answers from Judy. I had told her where I was and invited her to come over, warning her to come alone. I made it clear that if Mark showed up, I would assume it was with hostile intentions. When Judy arrived, the meeting was emotional. 
I was torn, still feeling love for her, yet that love was tainted by her betrayal. She insisted she hadn't helped Mark to hurt me but was rather trying to protect both of us from a worse situation. I listened as she explained, struggling to reconcile her words with her actions. Inside the fishing camp, I had set up a video recording on my laptop and phone, aiming at the chair where I planned for Judy to sit. I half-jokingly accused her of recording the conversation, to which she responded by stripping down, claiming she wanted to prove she had no recording devices on her. It was clear she was trying to play a game, perhaps trying to distract or seduce me, but I was focused on getting to the truth. Ignoring her provocations, I asked her to explain why she had lied to protect Mark, why she had chosen to betray our marriage. She tearfully admitted that she was scared and unsure of what to do, reacting in the moment without fully understanding the consequences. Judy confessed that she had lied to the police to cover for Mark, fearing the repercussions if the truth came out. I felt a mix of anger and sorrow as I listened to Judy. Her admission of lying to protect Mark, even in the face of my serious injury, was hard to accept. I was still reeling from the betrayal and the physical and emotional pain it had caused. Judy's actions had not only jeopardized our marriage but had also put my life at risk. The complexity of my feelings towards her was overwhelming, but one thing was clear, our relationship would never be the same again. The day after being discharged from the hospital, I retreated to my family's fishing camp to recuperate. I was planning to use all my medical leave, followed by my vacation time. My boss was understanding and even arranged for me to work remotely for a few hours a day so I could still earn my salary. While at the camp, I had time to think over Judy's actions and my own response. I realized how I had added to the complexity of the situation by accusing Judy and Mark of a more serious crime. However, reflecting on it, I felt justified. After all, I had been pushed down the stairs, and it was far from an accident. I had already taken steps to secure my finances, including cancelling our shared credit card and leaving Judy with a minimal amount. I wanted to make sure she wouldn't be able to use our funds freely until the court mandated any support. Julie, Mark's wife, acted swiftly upon learning about the affair. She secured a significant portion of their joint assets and had their investment accounts locked, ensuring her financial security. When Judy came to see me at the camp, she tried to convince me that their story was just a quick fabrication to cover up for the accident. According to her, Mark had suggested I would think I had misunderstood their interaction. I found her story full of inconsistencies. Judy then proposed a shocking offer. Mark had apparently offered to pay both of us a significant sum to alter our story and keep the affair under wraps. She even suggested using the money for counseling to repair our relationship. I was incredulous at her proposition, doubting the existence of the secret account she mentioned. Judy's narrative became even more unbelievable when she tried to justify her action, claiming fear and confusion in the heat of the moment. She continued to argue that Mark could secretly pay us off, but I dismissed her claims as implausible. Turning the conversation to the root of our issues, I asked Judy why she had started the affair in the first place. She tearfully explained that it began about three months ago, initially as just flirtation. She described how Mark's complaints about his own marriage had led to their affair, with Judy finding the conversation exciting and arousing. Judy then recounted how this excitement had spilled over into our relationship, leading her to be more physically aggressive with me. She admitted that she was acting out of character, driven by the thrill of her interactions with Mark. As she spoke, Judy made no attempt to cover herself, as if trying to entice me back into a physical relationship. Despite her apparent willingness and visible arousal, I resisted the temptation. I needed to stay focused on the truth and the decisions I had to make about our future. I was seeking a different kind of thrill, a physical one, Judy confessed. That weekend we spent together was incredible. We were so intimate, constantly. It was a weekend of passion and closeness. Judy continued, explaining how the intensity of that weekend had left her wanting more. She and Mark had talked the following week, and she found herself unintentionally sharing details about our intimate life. Mark had expressed his frustration with his own marriage, saying he craved more passionate encounters. Judy admitted she had become curious if Mark could provide the same level of intensity. I crave that feeling again, the intensity of being completely consumed, Judy said, admitting to her growing desire. I began fantasizing about more aggressive encounters, even during our moments together. Judy explained that her conversations with Mark had escalated until they eventually acted on their mutual desire. With Mark, it wasn't about love or affection. It was purely physical, a way to satisfy a craving I didn't even fully understand. And you enjoyed it, I stated bluntly. Judy nodded, tears in her eyes. It was intoxicating, like a drug. But it wasn't something I could ever mix with love. What I did with Mark, it was completely separate from how I feel about you. You kept going, even knowing the risks, I said, recalling the incident with the text message I had almost seen. You continued the affair, fully aware of the potential consequences. Judy attempted to defend her actions, saying she despised the term cheating but admitted she was drawn to the thrill of the secret affair. She seemed to regret the continuation of her affair with Mark, but it was too late for such reflections. As our conversation came to a close, Judy made a final plea. 
She asked for a chance to repair what was broken, even suggesting a physical reconnection. But I handed her clothes back to her and firmly stated that there was nothing left to reclaim. She had chosen her path. Judy reluctantly dressed and left. I could tell she was hoping for a change in my decision, but I remained resolute. As she drove away, her parting words were an apology, but they fell on deaf ears. Once she was gone, I turned off the recordings from my phone and laptop, ensuring I had a backup of the conversation. I then contacted the police sergeant, informing him that I had a video that might be of interest to their investigation. The events of that day solidified my resolve. Judy's choices had irrevocably changed the course of our relationship, and there was no going back. As I made copies of the video, my phone alerted me to an incoming call from Judy. I was preoccupied at the moment and didn't listen to the call immediately, but it was automatically recorded. Judy, unaware she was being recorded, spoke candidly. I just met with Robert, she said. He remembers everything clearly, even things I'd forgotten. She expressed relief that Mark hadn't accompanied her, as she feared I might have shot him. Judy recounted how I had suspected her of recording the conversation, leading her to strip naked to prove she wasn't carrying a recording device. She seemed astonished by my indifference to her body, noting my anger. Mark, on the other end, derided me, calling me a cuck and criticizing my refusal to reconcile with Judy. He seemed confident that there was no tangible proof of their affair. Judy corrected him, saying their relationship was now over. Mark worried about his wife discovering the affair, especially given the prenuptial agreement's terms. Judy then voiced her concerns about supporting herself if I chose to divorce her, even with the possibility of alimony. Mark reassured her, promising to send some business her way discreetly. Their conversation turned to the topic of paying me off to alter my story. Mark chuckled at the idea, considering it a long shot. He even joked about resorting to extreme measures rather than paying such a sum. Judy, alarmed by this, sternly warned him against any further threats. Once their call ended, I considered the possibility of Mark having an offshore account. It seemed reckless for him to disclose such information, but it might explain how he planned to fund the proposed payoff. Later, my attorney, Bergeron, visited me at the camp. He was intrigued by the video of my conversation with Judy. Bergeron planned to share it with the associate district attorney handling the case. The forensic evidence from the scene supported my account of the events, and charges against Mark were likely to be escalated to attempted murder. Bergeron explained how even Judy could face charges, given the evidence and her actions during the incident. He cautioned me about the potential twists a defense attorney might employ, trying to justify Mark's actions. That evening, I received a call from my father-in-law, who had just returned from a cruise and was catching up on the events. He expressed concern for my well-being and regretted not being able to visit me in the hospital. He mentioned that he and my mother-in-law had been unable to reach Judy and were worried about the situation. Bill, it's hard to break the news this way, I began, speaking to my father-in-law. He and his wife had always been kind to me, and I regretted having to share such distressing news. I didn't just fall down the stairs. I was pushed, almost thrown down by Judy's bus. I caught them in an intimate moment in my living room. It's a complete mess. Bill's shock was palpable, and I could hear Sandy, my mother-in-law, wailing in the background. You should talk to Judy and hear her side. As you can guess, I'm not at home right now. After a few moments, we ended the call. The next day, I focused on getting things moving legally. I called my attorney to check on the divorce papers, which were ready to serve to Judy. She hadn't been at work or the apartment, so the process server was trying to locate her. Soon after, Bergeron called to inform me that both Mark and Judy had been arrested that morning. He had taken the audio and video evidence I provided to the associate district attorney, who worked late to file all the necessary charges. The assistant da wanted to meet with me, so Bergeron and I headed to his office. The assistant da cautioned me about discussing any potential bribe to change my story, as it could be interpreted as my willingness to be bought off. I assured him that no amount of money could make me change my statement. I was more interested in ensuring that Julie Danvers knew about the alleged secret account Mark supposedly had. After I provided a written statement to that effect, the assistant da advised me to leave the investigating to the professionals. Mark faced charges of attempted X, and Judy was charged as an accomplice after the fact. Although Judy's potential punishment seemed lenient compared to the severity of the crime, the DA hinted at leniency if she testified against Mark. Later, my brother John helped me retrieve my belongings from the apartment. As we were packing, Sandy and Judy's sister Rachel arrived. Sandy was distraught, struggling to comprehend her daughter's actions and pondering if there was any chance for reconciliation. Rachel, meanwhile, shared her disappointment and disbelief at the situation. Sandy insisted on seeing the evidence I had, despite my reluctance to expose her to such distressing content. She was adamant about facing the truth, no matter how harsh it might be. I agreed to share the audio recordings but warned her about their explicit nature. As we talked, Sandy acknowledged that they would support Judy through her legal troubles, but not condone her actions. Rachel then shared her perspective on our relationship, comparing it to her own experiences and expressing admiration for the stability and loyalty she thought we had. 
She likened me to a dependable, loyal partner, though I joked about sounding like a border collie. Bill, I'm sorry you have to hear it this way, I told my father-in-law over the phone, regretting the circumstances. I wasn't just injured in an accident, I was deliberately attacked. I walked in on Judy and her boss in an intimate situation at our home. It's all turning into a big mess. Bill was understandably shocked by the news, and I could hear my mother-in-law, Sandy, reacting with distress in the background. I suggested they talk to Judy for her side of the story, knowing that my life was taking a different path now. The next morning, I contacted my attorney to follow up on the divorce paperwork. Judy hadn't been at work or our apartment, so they were still trying to locate her to serve the papers. Soon after, Berger and called to update me, both Judy and Mark had been arrested that morning. I had provided audio and video evidence to the associate district attorney, which led to their swift arrest. Bergeron and I then went to meet with the assistant Da, who cautioned me about discussing any bribe to change my story. I assured him that no amount of money could sway me, I was more interested in helping Julie Danvers uncover Mark's alleged secret account. Mark was charged with attempted murder, and Judy with being an accomplice after the fact. While I didn't want to see Judy suffer and Julie, I couldn't ignore her role in the whole affair. I instructed my lawyer to go ahead and serve Judy with the divorce papers. Later, as my brother John and I were retrieving my belongings from the apartment, we encountered Sandy and Judy's sister Rachel. Sandy was understandably upset and expressed hope for some sort of reconciliation, despite the circumstances. Rachel, meanwhile, confessed her long-standing feelings for me and offered her support, which caught me off guard. During this time, Cheryl, a nurse and our neighbor, approached. She had been instrumental in helping me after the attack. Cheryl shared that she had kept track of my condition, offering her advice and insight on my recovery. She even had video evidence of the incident, which she offered to forward to me. As John and I drove to the fish camp, he commented on the attention I was receiving from the women in Judy's family and even Cheryl. Despite the chaotic circumstances, it seemed I had several people concerned about my well-being. In the midst of this, I aimed to handle the divorce as amicably as possible. I offered Judy financial support to help her transition post-divorce, exceeding what the law required. Her lawyer recognized this was a favorable arrangement for her, and she quickly agreed to the terms. Meanwhile, Judy faced her legal challenges for her role in the attack, while Mark struggled with the consequences of his actions. Julie Danvers was taking decisive steps in her divorce, even investigating the secret account Mark allegedly had. To my amazement, the secret account that Mark Danvers had set up really did exist. Julie's lawyer confirmed its existence, and they managed to retrieve the funds from it. The whole scenario seemed like a movie plot, with Julie, her lawyer, and her son flying down to the Grand Cayman to withdraw the money. Mark, unaware of this development, was probably in for a rude awakening. What made it even more satisfying was knowing that since the account was in his son's name, it wasn't considered part of their marital assets. The repercussions for Mark didn't stop there, he also faced potential issues with the IRS over the mishandling of the account. Julie later shared with me that her sons had divided the money from the account, allocating it towards their college funds. It was a small comfort to see some integrity in the midst of all this chaos. My divorce from Judy was finalized long before the criminal trials began. Her trial was linked with Mark's due to their involvement in my assault. By then, Mark's resources had dwindled significantly, thanks to Julie's swift actions. He had lost not only a significant portion of his wealth but also his reputation and business. In a desperate bid for cash, he even agreed to sell his real estate franchise. During this period, Julie and I joked about creating a fake video to further incriminate Mark and Judy, but we eventually decided against it. The week before Mark's bail was due, Julie and I visited him in jail. I couldn't help but provoke him a little, and his reaction was explosive. He lost his temper and was subdued by the guards, resulting in his bail being delayed and almost denied. At his trial, Mark's inability to control his anger worked against him. He openly threatened me in court, undermining his defense. His lawyer tried to frame Mark's actions as a response to a traumatic situation but the forensics and testimonies clearly indicated his guilt. Despite his lawyer's efforts, Mark was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Judy's trial followed, and she reiterated her earlier testimony. However, she confessed that she had been complicit in covering up the truth after the assault. She was sentenced to a year in jail, but the judge insisted she serve at least three months, considering her initial false statement to the police. After her release, Judy came to see me. She wanted to apologize for her actions during our marriage and for her role in the incident. We hadn't spoken privately since our meeting at the fish camp. Judy expressed her regret for how she had behaved and thanked me for not publicizing the video of our last conversation. She told me about the reaction of her family, especially her mother, who had seen the video taken by Cheryl's mother. Judy was clearly remorseful, acknowledging the damage she had caused to our marriage and to her own reputation. As expected, Judy asked if there was any possibility of us getting back together, suggesting counseling or a prenuptial agreement. I shook my head, explaining that such arrangements hadn't prevented her previous indiscretions. I also dismissed the idea of dating her sister Rachel. 
While I had affection for her and her family, I knew that pursuing a relationship with her sister would only lead to complications and potential strife within their family. Curiosity got the better of me, and I asked Judy if she had been involved with anyone during her time in jail. She jokingly called me a perv before sharing a tense incident where she had to offer a rather awkward apology to another inmate to avoid conflict. Her description of the strip searches and the daily routines in jail was both sobering and a stark reminder of the consequences of her actions. We both laughed at the thought of Mark undergoing similar experiences in jail, and Judy mentioned that Julie planned to visit him with her sons, joking about the harsh reality of prison life. After our conversation, Judy left, expressing a hope for my forgiveness someday. Sometime later, I heard about Mark's rough adjustment to prison life, which involved a violent incident in the shower room. After my experience with Judy, life took a positive turn when I started a relationship with Cheryl, the nurse who had helped me during my recovery. We connected on many levels, and before long, she moved in with me. Our relationship blossomed, and a year later, we got married. Together, we decided to start a family right away. Communication and trust were the cornerstones of our relationship, and we both valued fidelity highly. As for Mark, who was still serving his sentence, I couldn't help but harbor some hard feelings. I was wary of the day he would be released from prison, still feeling a bit vindictive towards him for his past actions. My comment, the other two got their punishment and you got to walk freely, time to focus on yourself. 